Welcome back to Object Oriented Programming, Part 17. This will actually be the end of Part 1. If we were doing this as a college class, the pressure cooking program we talked about would have been part of your final exam. Of course, all of the items that have been highlighted in yellow throughout are concepts that would also be part of your final exam because you need to know the concepts since they apply evenly across all object-oriented design and all object-oriented programming languages. So let's uh, talk a little bit about what we just did. Did you have any problems with that last program? I hope you did because unless you're some kind of genius um, this is all brand new to you and it should have been difficult. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and look at the final pressure cooker program. First let's look at the loop, the main program. You see it's only six lines and that's quite typical for something like this. GUIs for example are typically one or two lines. Check timer runs each time around the loop. That's important because we don't want to set the food on fire, we want to make sure it turns off on time. And that way the machine can keep track of how long it's been cooking. Additionally, each time around the loop, the buttons are checked because you never know when the user is going to touch a button and he could start or stop the process at any time. The main pressure cooker class has two constants. It keeps the user from leaving the machine on indefinitely. That's the only reason they're there. The constructor initializes all of the variables and makes sure to set the power off. Now, one of the things I want you to note is that the variables belong to the pressure cooker, not to the buttons. Remember, the buttons are sort of like the buttons on your keyboard. <clears throat> they don't do any of the processing. They just tell you what the user wants. Display time, which is one of our methods, uses the div mod function to separate time to cook into hours and minutes. You should see how that works. Display cycle and display power would turn on and off different LEDs on the front of the pot. Of course, there is no pot we have right now. Therefore, we don't have any LEDs, but we know we're going to need those methods. Now, those methods would be given to us by the hardware uh, manufacturer, whatever hardware manufacturer we're using. Cycle power uses the not operator to switch between true and false, and then calls the appropriate method to actually turn the power on or off. So that's an example of the not operator. In pressure cooker class, check timer is really the meat of the program, if you don't mind my pun. It gets the time that we've been cooking in seconds. It uses integer division to translate that into minutes. If we still have some minutes left to cook, then go ahead and update the display. If we're done cooking, turn off the power. If we're not done cooking, check the temperature of the PID controller. What is a PID controller? Please hold. New terminology will be coming up at the end of this. The PID controller method would turn on and off the hardware PID controller and set its temperature according to whatever the cycle temperature should be for that particular cycle. Since we don't have a hardware controller, we're using the keyword pass, which again does nothing. Check burner temperature, that's a safety method to check the physical temperature of the burner versus what we expect. If it's not correct, then we're going to send a message to the hardware controller. So that acts as a duplicitous or redundant check on the temperature, which is important. Again, we don't want to set the food on fire or the house on fire. Set power, it's another one of those meaty methods. It has a few lines, but it basically turns on or off the entire cooker. If we're going to turn it on, you gotta start a timer, you gotta start the PID, you gotta set 
the variables for power, you gotta set the timer and all this kind of good stuff. If we're going to turn it off, well then we have to do all of that again and, but you know, in the off method. We're always going to update the time display whenever we hit set power. And this method is also called when the constructor runs because we want to make sure we set the power off. Very first thing when you plug the machine in. Now we can have some improvements to this class. The timer really should be by itself, but hey, luckily you've already written the timer class. We called it timer stuff, so we can just use it. And the cooker maybe goes to the warm cycle for two hours after cooking is done. That's actually how my pressure cooker works. So try to make these improvements on your own. They're pretty simple improvements. Um, but just gives you an idea of that no matter what you do, you can always improve it. A little quick review. This class is a simple example of publishers and subscribers. Remember we talked about that concept? When we actually add the hardware controllers, this class will be the publisher or the boss. It sends orders and events to the subscribers. The hardware controllers would be the subscribers or the underlings, the employees. Those guys will respond as necessary. Optionally, they would send status reports back to the boss. That would be the publisher. That would be the pressure cooker class. That's how the pressure cooker knows what temperature, for example, the burner is at. Note the use of the to do with a colon shortcut from Eclipse. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a tasks view. And as you put comments with that keyword to do and then a colon, it'll make that list for you and keep it up to date and tell you where to find your to-do items. Eclipse does a million things. That's just something I find very, ha very, very handy. Now let's look at the ABC pressure cooker and the buttons main class. Well, the ABC pressure cooker, the manufacturer told me that all of the pressure cookers that start with the model ABC, they're gonna have three buttons but everything else is the same as the base class. There's nothing really magical about this class, but it leaves us room for change. Maybe the manufacturer says that all the ABC ones are going to have, I don't know, a black color or something. The cooker buttons class, that's the root class for all buttons that will be forever created. And you can use them, obviously, in things other than pressure cookers. Maybe we're also going to create a toaster for these people. The root class is cooker buttons, although maybe it should be called appliance buttons. But here's where we specify all the attributes that all of the buttons forever and ever will share. You notice that run does absolutely nothing, but maybe in the future, we implement a counter that keeps track of how many times the button was pushed. That way you can tell the user, hey, it's time to clean the filter or some such thing. If we add a new attribute, like text color or button size or maybe the self-destruct button, all buttons ever created will also inherit those attributes. And again, that's why we do it. So let's talk about the specific buttons here. Now there's not much to talk about because as we mentioned, it's really a lot like the buttons on your keyboard. So the menu button allows the user to select one of the cooking cycles. So it uses self.cooker.cycleIndex because the cooking cycles are on the cooker, not on the button. Note the use of the percent operator if you remember the percent operator gives you the remainder of an integer division. That way we don't really have to keep track of button pushes and reset it every time we hit six or whatever. The time button uses the same operator and this one just allows the user to add minutes for the cooking cycle. This one is going to update the display again on the cooker when you push it because the button itself doesn't have a display so it has to know to talk to the cooker. That's why we kept a pointer to the cooker object. 
The start cancel button uses a button to just turn it on and off. Really there's nothing special here. All of the meat of the program is in the cooker class where it belongs because the cooker is actually doing the work. The buttons are just buttons like the keyboard buttons are. This is an example of a controller in the model view controller model. Okay, It implements the logic, it implements the processes, it implements you know the meat of what we have to do. It does not implement how it appears to the user, nor how we store or retrieve data. Those are things that are left for the view and the model programs. Now this may seem frivolous or stupid to differentiate this way, but it's a big, big deal because we want to be able to reuse things. This controller program we could use with a GUI, and in fact we will next in order to check that it actually works right. And we'll use the GUI for the view so that it tells us what buttons are being pushed. Now, what the heck is PID? It is not pelvic inflammatory disease, though I guess it could be. It is a proportional integral derivative controller, which is a fancy, fancy name for the cruise control in your car. Okay, it's a type of controller that attempts to fine tune the output of a device in order to reach a determined set point. And then it maintains that set point using feedback. So your cruise control in your car pushes the accelerator between zero and 100% and then maintains the speed of the car by constantly varying the accelerator. This is opposed to on and off controllers like the thermostat for your house HVAC. That one just turns it on and then turns it off. If your cruise control worked like that, it would push the accelerator to 100% until you got to say 60 miles an hour plus or minus two. And then it would simply turn off the engine and let you cruise until you got to, say, 58 miles an hour. And then it would put the accelerator at 100% again. And that would be really jerky, and that's not what we want. That's, for example, how your electric stove works. If you've ever noticed, the burner turns on, and then it turns off. Then it turns on, then it turns off. That's how your HVAC works. That's how a lot of things work. However, for this example, we're going to use a PID, or we want to use a PID. In fact, your pressure cooker probably has one. It's sort of like a dimmer for the heating element. It sets it between 0 and 100%, and then keeps it there in order to maintain the temperature correct. Okay, another little method, I'm sorry, um, con concept that you need to understand. Constants really aren't constants. In Python and in a lot of other languages, the constants really aren't. In fact, in Python, there's no such thing as a constant. We declare the what we call constants in uppercase for clarity so that we know we want them to be constant, but we can change them at will. Now, how the heck does that make any sense? A constant really is something that should not change during runtime. The, you know, gravity of the moon isn't going to change while we are working on our program. However, it could change at some point. So a constant is really something that shouldn't change during runtime. Now let's say a subclass of pressure cookers has a different max cook time or max warm time. Well, it would be really inconvenient and silly to have some variable called max cook time just for my type of cooker. And then you would have to change it in all of the methods and everything that ever uses those constants. And that would just be a real pain. The subclass can simply set max cook time to something else. Instead of 3 times 60 minutes, maybe it's 4 times 60 minutes, whatever. 
but it can set it differently because it's not actually a constant. But it will be a constant during the actual processing of the program. So it's something that should not change during runtime. All the methods will simply use the same name and everybody's happy. Now the next important concept. The equal sign does not make a copy of an object. It links objects. In Python and again in other languages, the equals operator does not make a copy. So if we take that example there and we say shoots equals and we make that list and then shoots2 equals shoots, shoots2 is not a copy of shoots. Shoots2 is a link to the object that is linked by shoots. So why do we do this? Well, because making copies of objects could theoretically take a ton of RAM and a ton of space and a ton of time, and we don't normally want to do it. So if we do this example on the screen, shoots two sub zero equals ESA, and then we print shoots, we get that result. Now you'll see that shoots also changed because neither one of them hold the object. They're both addresses to the object. If you really wanted to make a separate copy, copy here in yellow because it's a concept, you would have to invoke the copy keyword. And again, their copy is in black because it's a keyword. So if we do this, shoots3 equals copy of shoots2, and then we change something in shoots3 and make it China Space Agency, and we print the two of them, you see they are indeed different. Shoots3 is what's called a shallow copy of shoots. Shoots2 and shoots3 point to different objects. However, copy does not copy objects that are embedded the same way that horse foot is embedded in horse hand. This whole thing trips up beginners because usually what happens is a beginner will change the value of a parameter somewhere inside a method. Parameters are input values. Don't touch them. So that's the end of this little section, and I hope you enjoyed it. And again, I know it's a whole lot of concepts, but that is the, the point of this class because object-oriented design and object-oriented programming are conceptual things. It's not the way that a human brain thinks. Hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.